Because you can't always play the game you want, welcome to the game we're in. I'm Maya May, and I'm here with senior LP strategist Trigvi Olson. We are keeping a close watch on the 22 midterms so you don't have to, and we're right in the middle of primary season. This week, we're focusing on two key house primary races in Virginia. We'll recap Nevada, but before we get to that, Trigvi, we got to talk about Michigan candidate <laughs> Ryan Kelly. He kind of looks like my high school principal, but far more dangerous. <laughs> We, <laughs> he might be like your high school principal. I don't know. You know, I, I, he might be that, or he might be the kid in study hall. It's just kind of the smart ass with dimples, Maya, that, you know. Oh, well, that's everybody... the thing. He looks like he's like a nice guy. For me, when I see the dimples, I go, that's a safe guy. But he's, he just got arrested, right? What, what's <laughs> So, yeah, Ryan <laughs> Kelly was kind of an also ran in the governor's race in Michigan. He's had quite a quite a 10 day period. He gets arrested by the FBI for, for on charges related to his involvement in January 6th. Um, a judge <laughs> orders him to surrender all his guns over his objections. He goes bananas. And a week and a half later, there's a poll and Ryan Kelly is now the front runner to be the nominee in Michigan after his arrest and beyond his arrest. There really hasn't been anything that Ryan Kelly has been doing other than getting arrested for one six and going bananas at a judge for asking him to surrender his his weapons. I mean, we're um, at a critical point right now where like the guy, he looks like the innocuous guy with dimples and he's being arrested. And that's the thing that catapults him to the top of the GOP slate. I mean, half of them are getting disqualified left and right uh, for fraudulent signatures. But this is crazy to me. It feels like this is like a point in our time where we have to call out the danger because as hilarious as it is, it's dangerous. Yeah. You know, it's incredibly serious. And, and if you'll recall, for those who, who've been with us from show one, right, I, I was saying about Doug Mastriano that they were going to wrap Doug Mastriano in uh, prettier packaging in Michigan and Wisconsin and Arizona. They were going to market the brand out of them, but it's still a shit sandwich. But you know what? You know, Kelly is kind of, Ryan Kelly is kind of maybe demonstrating that I was wrong. Because, like, he's just an unwrapped crap sandwich sitting there on the table, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, this Boiled guy, hammer. and he's making no apologies for it. No. And, you know, and you've got this whole mentality, you know, it says a lot about where the base of the Republican Party is. There mm -hmm. is no managing it. There is going to be more and more crazy. We've been seeing it all over. We saw it at the Texas Republican Convention. We're going to talk about some other places that we've seen it. Um and yeah, Ryan Kelly's got the dimples. He looks good. But in reality, you know. Um, he's dangerous. He I mean, he's dangerous. He's dangerous. He's and really, people, really dangerous. Yeah. And so I really need people outside of Michigan to pay attention to this because I think sometimes we um, miss the signals, miss the signs of the crazy as it is. Uh, and it is here. The crazy is officially here. Um, but let's, uh, let's turn to this week's primary races starting in Virginia. Yeah. Um, now, if you've seen our show before, you know that we rate each race based on a defensive democracy score, which takes into account a few factors. And in the end, a score of 17 and above means that this race is critical to the preservation of our democracy. So we'll talk more about this throughout the show. Um, and if you want to, you can also check out previous episodes of The Game We're In for a further explanation of it. But let's talk Virginia. It's the main event this week. Yeah, so, you know, Virginia is, Virginia is interesting because so when we went about that process of rating 350 races on our three metrics, how important are they to the 2024 elections? How important are they to control and protecting the guardrails of democracy? And, and how much illiberalism is there in the race? Potential for real illiberal people to get elected. Um, you know, house races scored a little lower, right? Because there's so many house races across the country. Um, but Virginia actually is one of those places that has two house races kind of outside those big three states of Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin. It's a place that has two house races that scored 17. The first one that we're going to talk about is Abigail Spanberger's district, um, which is, is Virginia seven. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, the, it's one of a few house races that received that score of 17. Um, and it's a big deal. Now, Abigail Spanberger, you know, her background, she was a CIA operative, uh, joined the CIA after 9-11. And, and she's Which, running and for re-election. 
We also have an ad from her. I think it's important for people to kind of see a little bit of Abigail Spambrier before we uh, get yeah. into the weeds of talking about this race. I always wanted to be in the CIA, but after 9-11, it felt even more important to serve. When I ran for Congress, I didn't run to serve a party. I ran to serve our country. As a nation, we've overcome difficult challenges like the ones we face today. The best way forward is working together regardless of party, standing up to lobbyists and corporate PACs, solving problems, serving people. That's what matters. I'm Abigail Spanberger. I approve this message. Solving problems and serving people. I like it. Right. So, you know, the thing about Abigail Spanberger is she's a moderate Democrat. She is, the, it's another one of those districts, like we talked about last week, where majorities in the U.S. House are built, right? And she's, she's a moderate Democrat. She's um, representing a district that's pretty purple. Um, they redrew her district and moved her north from basically the suburbs in Richmond up into parts of Northern Virginia. So the, the district runs a long ways. She's the kind of candidate and the kind of voice that's just essential for the Democrat party and for more broadly uh, for, for those on team democracy to have in the U.S. House. She's just a critically important voice. She got some headlines recently about 1-6 because, because of her CIA background, she was watching what was going on and she actually reached out to AOC and who she really didn't have a lot of a relationship with, according to the book by Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns and said, Hey, you know, just be aware, like from my background, there could be trouble. You're a target. Here's just some advice of which you should follow. She's also somebody who, according to the reporting, uh, was talking to Liz Cheney on day one while people were still in the Capitol. She's kind of one of those moderate voices that's really important for, yeah. for Democrats to have in, in the House. Yeah, I'd love to have her on speed dial. Um, but unfortunately, there are six Republican candidates who are trying to unseat her. Um, any of these uh, Republicans or any of these dangerous folks kind of like our guy in Michigan? Yeah. So when you look at, at the people who are running against her, um, you know, the kind of the consensus candidate is Crystal Vouch. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, we might have a spot from her. Um, the, um, they're all running as, as various flavors of MAGA as we're seeing across the country. Uh, Bryce Reeves and, and Anderson have run more as the, you know, I don't know that they're Kathy for truth MAGA, but they're sort of this I'm military bravado mega. Um, you've got Vouch who's running, you know, she wants to, I'll be the Biden, Pelosi, Spanberger, liberal agenda stopper candidate. Um, so whoever comes out of that's going to be pretty, pretty much a four or five on the liberal scale. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I want any of the Trump flavors. Um, I don't want that ice cream. That's. Yeah. That's the, it, especially because we are seeing all of these calls for violence um, and all this, you know, dehumanization of fellow Americans. It's very dangerous to have these kind of candidates, um, just even having a platform, let alone um, entering into Congress. So uh, yes, for truly. Sure. And then there's another House race uh, as well in Virginia, uh, Virginia House 2. It's ranked 17th among your top races and considered by many to be one of the most competitive midterm elections. Um, can we talk about that? I think the yeah, Democrat so, you know, Virginia, Virginia, when it comes to the House, is kind of a hot seat. So Elaine Loria, who's mm -hmm. on the 1-6 committee, um, she's up for re-election. Um, much like the Spanberger district, it's essential you know, it's one of those essential districts that Democrats have to win. She has a military background. That district is basically Norfolk, um, Virginia Beach, and then the, and then the um, the area that's out along the ocean, uh, which I'm, I'm mind blanking on because I'm old. Um, the, but it's sort of it covers that kind of area um, because of the military background of that of that area. Obviously, you have the big you know, Navy base, in Navy base right there. Yeah. Right. So um, almost all the candidates have to have that kind of a background to succeed. Again, the Republican legislature in the state of Virginia tweaked that seat around. So her seat got a little more Republican. 
um, a little more challenging. It's still a Democrat leaning district, but again, it's a 17 2 It's one of the one of the biggest races in the country. Um, it's elevated in some ways um, less about it's a little bit below Spanberger on control, but it's a little bit higher in terms of 2024 because, you know, let's face it, Republicans and I hate to use this word given greet and Zad today, but they're hunting those members of the of the one six committee that they can go after. And she's the most vulnerable, probably Democrat on that committee. Yeah. Um, and actually, I do believe we have an ad for her. So um, I'd love to run yeah. that. So we can see what she's all about. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I took that oath the first time when I was 17 years old and went to the Naval Academy and took it again upon every promotion during my 20 year Navy career and most recently now serving in Congress representing my district. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. It is making people sit up and take notice tonight that Elaine Luria has now joined six of her fellow freshman Democrats to call those actions, quote, an impeachable offense. God help me. Devastating news today for the Trump administration. Critical new evidence tying President Trump to possible abuse of power. So I am about to enter the office on which the duties of discharge I will well and faithfully take. They should investigate the Biden. The president pushed eight times for an investigation into Joe Biden. So you did ask Ukraine to look into Joe Biden? Of course I did. This obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that, that I bear is very clearly an impeachable offense to me um, that the president enlisted the help of a foreign leader to conduct an investigation to malign his political opponent. True faith and allegiance to the same enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all that. I didn't come to Washington to impeach the president, but I also didn't spend 20 years in the Navy to allow our Constitution to be trampled on. I will swear solemnly. And people might say, well, why would you do that? You might not get reelected. I, I don't care because I did the right thing. I do. A powerful oath truly this duty to country above politics that should help her right with given how many military people are in her district yeah i think that's a, i mean it's a great spot for the audience that is her district right like there's a lot of buttons being pushed that that ad probably wouldn't work in a lot of districts across the united states but in one that's as heavily military that might be one of the most military districts in the country um, incredibly powerful. You know, you see the stuff where she's talking about what Trump did vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, which obviously people who are in the military um, probably sort of more cognizant of what that means because they've had some experiences with it. Um, Putin and then the, and then the whole oath. I mean, she's taking she's taking what Republicans have been trying to own and flipping it on its head exactly. and holding them accountable. And yeah. uh, they're that is something, regardless of the district, that uh, that Democrats could learn from. Yes, actually. Um, it, yeah, it's like, who's the patriot now? Like, who's the true right. patriot? Because Republicans, you don't own the word. You just absolutely do not. Right. Uh, not when you are attacking the Capitol. Um, let's... Let's go to Nevada. Let's recap uh, that race. We should, we should talk one thing just quick. Oh, I have one other yep. point. So Kiggins, who's her potentially probably going to be her opponent, it looks mm -hmm. like. She's establishment back um, and less Trump-esque. But she's another one of these who's trying to wrap herself in the pretty package. Because what you have is you, you also have somebody who will refuse to say that Biden was lawfully elected president. So it's that same game that's going on. She, she also has a background in the military. 
Um, she has tried to not be Trump-esque because there is some baggage with Trump in that district. But when pressed, she's not saying it. And this is where it gets into, Maya. We're seeing this all over the country. She won't say that Biden is a lawful president because if she does, she'll be sunk in that primary. And it's going to be really interesting to see because her opponents have been calling her out on that pretty hard. And, and we all need to, like everybody, like that right yeah. there, Trigby, when you say that, like, especially given what the Texas GOP, like what they're basically saying is they don't believe in democracy. Like, that's mind blowing to me that a candidate who refuses to say that Joe Biden is the lawfully elected president in the United States, like this is just a recipe for future disaster. So I'm hoping the January 6 hearings um, are going to remind people of why this is so important. And is that what you're well, thinking? They, got another one coming yeah, up. I, they, I mean, here's the thing. The Texas Republicans, they either don't care, they, they know the truth and they don't care, or they're so far gone, they're like Jim Carrey in the Truman Show. They're <laughs> They're just living in a reality that doesn't exist, right? So, yeah. like, and either way, it it it's really bad. It's really, really bad. Yeah. Because you know, I I think it, we talked earlier about Ryan Kelly, right? Like, there was a time in America, maybe outside of Illinois, where people and Republicans didn't like their uh, candidates for governor or their governors to be under investigation by the FBI. You know right. what I mean? Outside of Illinois, where it happened all the time. <laughs> hey, that's um, not fair, but it is true. So, <laughs> it is true. All of them. They all I was like, the well, is out of prison, though, now, right? Like, I think he's right. out. Uh, yeah, I think he, he might have gotten pardoned by Trump. But yeah. anyway, I mean, that's the whole point, right? Like, they're, they're refusing, they're denying reality. And then, not only that, people who go even further and get arrested by the FBI for what they were doing and committing acts of basically sedition on one six, that suddenly becomes the only thing that you have to do to be qualified because you're getting your bona fides. Yeah, no, clearly. And so we all, uh, anybody who wants to continue living in a democracy needs to pay attention to that. Um, definitely need to pay attention to what's happening in Nevada because the MAGA crowd won big last Tuesday. Uh, Adam Laxalt won the Senate Republican primary and Joe Lombardo won the governor Republican primary. Trick V, are, are we doomed? Like, what, how does this affect things going into November now? <laughs> so, you know, our big news from Nevada, at least from a Lincoln Project perspective, is, uh, and, and, and I've adopted your sirens as an idea. <laughs> we now have a siren on the graphic, right? Woo, woo, woo. But um, <laughs> that governor's race in Nevada, we've now moved up to an 18. Um, putting it on a par with, not quite with Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, but right underneath it. So it's right there with the Senate race in, in Arizona and the governor's race, um, the Pennsylvania Senate race. That Nevada governor's race has become a massive race. And it's become a massive race because of the stakes um, down ballot with the Senate race there where Cortez Masto is in a really tough race, um, you know, sort of here in D.C., the establishment Republicans really view Laxalt as kind of their guy who can, they can get through. You know, he's, his father was Pete Domenici, his grandfather on his mother's side was Paul Laxalt. So like he's kind of royalty, even though he's taken on a very Trumpist persona. Um, they view this as the race that, that they think they're going to take from the Democrats, right? And so uh, that governor's race is going to be the driver turnout. And then we got we got the hardcore MAGAs in, in the three uh, house races where there's Democrats who could very easily be vulnerable. If, if Nevada really starts to melt down at the governor's level, it has the potential to be a total train wreck for Democrats nationally. And so every Democrat- And that means a train wreck for the country though, Trigvi. Can you, like, that's the siren. <laughs> yeah, it does. And, and I mean, you know, for people sitting in California or New York, who are saying, well, why should I care about what goes on in Nevada? Well, you should care what goes on in Nevada, because if the governor's race in Nevada breaks down and the Senate race breaks down, you're probably going to end up losing two or three House seats, which makes taking the majority, as I said last week, almost impossible. If you don't win Nevada, those three seats in Nevada, um, you're probably losing the U.S. Senate if Laxalt is there and you're getting somebody who's, you know, been all in on Trump. Um, and you got a presidential election where is Nevada as important as, as Michigan or Pennsylvania 
well, it's smaller, so it has less electoral votes. But again, it's a state that's traditionally gone Democrat, and you'd be electing an election denier. I was like, you just gave me a so panic attack. It, it doesn't attack matter if you're in New York or California, you want to have a presidential election, or you want to have guardrails of democracy defended. That's why we're now scoring that in 18, and we've got that Laxalt race at a 17. So I was like going to say, is this time for people to move? Do we need people to move to Nevada? I know that's a strategy that some people have floated. <laughs> uh, well, Nevada is a pretty nice state all, uh, uh, on the all in all. I mean, yeah, I like well, Nevada. I was going to say, I was like, pack a rise, let's go. I was like, yeah. what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas if it's our democracy. That's what we yeah, want. We, the, we don't want what's happening potentially in Vegas bleeding. It's more what's happening in Reno that might be the problem than Vegas, but. It's a very good point. Very good point. I've been up to Reno. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, I've been to Reno and Vegas. I, I, I don't mind Vegas. Vegas is pretty good. But I'm kind of a Fremont Street guy. I'm old school. Oh, yeah. Old school Vegas is the best Vegas. Yeah, obviously. You don't want to spend too much time on the strip. Yeah. Uh, so we're paying close attention to Vegas, Nevada, Reno, of course, um, and the primaries. But it's important because we need to know how to approach the midterms, right? We have to keep our eyes on the prize, right? So we're always looking forward. And you've sounded the alarm about the three Nevada House races for Democrats. Um, but is there anything that we can do, like going ahead? Like, how do we help? Because that's what everybody's asking. Everybody at home wants to know, how do we help? How do we contribute? Is it donations? What, what are the things that we can do? So this is what I'd say, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have your races at home. You're going to have your own congressional races and all of that. And they may be safe seats, right? So when, but, or they may be, there may be in a liberal actor that you'd like to see lose, who's not likely to lose. You know, what I would say to people is in an election cycle like this, we have to, we have to prioritize. And so spend a little bit of your time and effort, um, and if you can, some treasure on trying to help the local candidates who can make a difference, but then take the other half and apply it to democracy. And we've got, you know, the list out there publicly where um, where we think are the places that our democracy is are dependent and and use some of your time and your talents and your resources to back those candidates in those places, too. Because, I, you know, it's always easy to say, oh, I really can't, I, you know, you're living in California, you see Marjorie Taylor Greene, I want to see her beat. But, um, you know, the, the reality is you can afford to have Marjorie Taylor Greene get reelected and she's going to get reelected. You can't afford to have, have Doug Mastriano or Ryan Kelly elected in Pennsylvania or Michigan if you want democracy to continue the way you've known it in the United States. Though she sure is a distraction, that Marjorie Taylor Greene. So I wouldn't mind uh, seeing somebody beat her <laughs> in, in uh, November. It's so, just not going to um, happen in Georgia 14. No, that's not I know. I know. But we need to look ahead um, at the primaries that are taking place in the near future before we go. Next week, we have Mike Lee and Evan McMullen in Utah. Uh, there's something really interesting going on there uh, with Democrats. Can you explain yeah, it's a big, I, you know, it, it's not just, uh, yeah, it's Democrats and, and, and committing themselves completely to being Democratic. And, you know, I, I have somebody on Twitter who every time I'm on the show is like, it's Democratic Party, not Democrat Party. Uh, so to my Twitter fan who constantly is bringing that up every time I do the show, I'm sorry. But when it comes to democracy and being Democratic in, in Utah, um, Evan McMullen, former CIA operator, uh, operative Mormon missionary investment banker, never Trumper ran for president. Um, he, he, he's running as an independent and the democratic party members who could have been running in that Senate seat said, you know what, we're going to get out of this race because the Democrats not going to win in, in Utah. We'll lose to Mike Lee, but Evan McMullen might be able to win. If we back him, if he can get all I mean, with that background, so back him. <laughs> I mean, back him. <laughs> and and that's smart strategy. That's right. a classic. You know, I have my my seven rules for dealing with autocrats. You know, that's that's zero sum judo right there. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, Mike Lee is Mike Lee going to lose? It, you know, McMullen's got his work cut out for him. But boy, if Evan McMullen were to were to pull that off, that would be a big deal. And he's somebody that deserves some support and, 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 um, and encouragement for what he's trying to do. Cause he's trying to stand for that middle ground in a, in a really red place and say, this is crazy. So. 
Yeah, we need a lot more of that in order to get the country uh, on the right track, on the right path. And we need people to support that because if people aren't supporting it, it just lets the crazies know that they're somehow running the game, that they have the reins and we can't have that. So we've got to go with uh, the stuff that makes sense uh, for a, our future. This is, this is, I'm not giving up on that. Um, we also need to talk about Colorado. What is happening? Uh, what's happening there? What's going on? Well, so um, Laurent Boebert is busy suggesting that fentanyl is a weapon of mass destruction. I saw that and I was like, what? Like, not the way that it was worded, like it's an actual bill, like it's a bill proposed. And I'm like, is, is she trolling us at this point? I mean, she has a bar called Shooters and she's talking about all these fentanyl deaths. And I'm like, but all the, what about the gun violence deaths? Is, are we being trolled by Lauren, Lauren Boebert here? Because we know she's not a serious person. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm capable of psychoanalyzing Lauren Boebert, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, you know, I don't know what she's trying to achieve. I think with that thing, it's, it's kind of a play to China, right? Like China is supposedly shipping all this fentanyl here. So, you know, there may be a little bit of a race thing going on in it. I, it's hard to say other than, um, you know, she's somebody that we at the Lincoln Project feel like we have to target to point out to people the level of crazy that exists in illiberalism and just anti-democratic, non-civil behavior that's going on by some of these people. Um, yeah. And she's an example of that. And so, you know, we fully recognize her district as such that, you know, she's likely to prevail. Um, but we also get that we need to make sure that other Americans understand the cognitive dissonance between what they believe, particularly Republicans, and somebody like her. And that's, exactly. that's, that's where we're going to target her. Yeah. I mean, she's clearly um, close to being one of the House's dumbest members. That one's a toss up between, I think, her and Marjorie Taylor Greene. But um, I should <laughs> confuse the fact that, like, as dangerous as she is, she's mm -hmm. one member of Congress. What's right. crazy is... You know, you know, in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, now you've got somebody like like her um, potentially as the governor of those states. Please don't say that. I was like, no, well, I mean, <laughs> like... <laughs> and it's not like, you know, Pennsylvania and Michigan are big states. Right. No, right? I this is absolutely. Well, and this is why we all need to come to our senses. Um, and there are. Uh, sensible members of uh, Congress that are people who are running who are sensible. Uh, can we talk about the incumbent in Colorado 8? Uh, that is a new district. Um, you've called this a classic swing district. What, what does it look like? Yeah, so um, you've got you've got uh, Yadira Caravo, Caravo? Caraveo. Yadira Caraveo. Not right. Sí, hablo um, español. <laughs> yeah, she's um, she's the former you know, she's a former undocumented dreamer who's really an American success story. Um, she's running against Barbara Kirkmeyer, who's yeah. <laughs> full on Trump, you know, saying that he, is a, he was a darn good president. Um, it's a real, you know, it's a classic swing district. It's north of Denver. It, you know, Colorado picked up a seat. Um, it's, a, it's a great pickup chance for Democrats. Um, because they have a real, they have a really, you know, they have a good contrast there in a place where in theory that contrast should work well. But again, it's all going to be, it's, to some degree, it's going to be turned out, you know, how many people in those, in those Denver suburbs turn out to vote and are they paying attention? I hope many, they are. What are they voting on? And that's <laughs> on all of us to yeah. make sure that they understand that. Yeah. That's one of the, you know, that's another one of our races at 16, 17. Yeah, it's a, it's a high number, so we need to pay attention. Um, next week, we're also looking at Illinois 17. Can you give us a quick 30-second teaser of that race? Yeah, you have Esther Joy King. Um, she's, um, she's similar to Greetings in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, all in for Trump. Um, and then, you know, they have a real candidate running against her. He was an economics teacher, National Guardsman is the one candidate. And then you've got another 
another candidate who's a little bit more extreme on the liberals on the, the left side. She's a Wall Street person who made her money in cannabis. Um, and I can tell you, being from that part of the world, as you know, too, um, in that part of Illinois, that may be seen as a little bit more of a stretch than it would be maybe in a California or New York district, right? All right. Um, but yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a big district, a big big race, um, you know, because that I I think seventeen used to be numbers wise Kinsinger's district, but Illinois was really a state that was shuffled in redistricting. Yeah. I was going to say, and that's my state. So I'm like, I'm always paying attention to what's happening in Illinois Um, because Illinois spans, you know, a lot of people think of Illinois, they think of Chicago, but uh, most of Illinois is actually pretty rural. Um, So it makes sense to kind of pay attention to those areas because that's where Democrats have always struggled. Um, You mentioned uh, that uh, Esther Joy King, similar to our candidate from Missouri, who we got to talk about this ad. This ad ran today. Um, You know, there's a lot of debate on whether or not we should show this ad or whether people should uh, spread the word. But I think it's important to understand exactly how violent and how dangerous these people are, because that's as, that to me is what's going to get our apolitical friends off their couches, uh, get registered to vote and making sure they're voting. What are your thoughts on this ad? Are we going to show the ad, or, or do I think we we're going to show? Are we going to show the ad? I think I think we should show the ad. Do you want I to show think the we ad? should show the ad too. I'm Eric oh. Greitens, Navy SEAL, and today we're going rhino hunting. The rhino feeds on corruption and is marked by the stripes of cowardice. Join the MAGA crew, get a rhino hunting permit. There's no bagging limit, no tagging limit, and it doesn't expire until we save our country. It's dangerous and it's disgusting. That's my take. It's so, you know, I mean, politics is in normal times and the game we know can be a rough and tumble business. And they're, there have been some hard hitting ads that have run throughout history on both sides. You got Willie Horton, you got the Daisy spot. Like there's some famous ads um, that, you know, have gotten to a certain line, but it's all been in within the game we're in. Um, this, this is, this is one of the most outrageous things I've seen. And, you know, this is something I was saying this to a reporter today. Um, every political consultant who makes ads on the Republican party and operatives on the Republican party should be asked if they approve what they think of this ad and, and does this ad go too far? There should be condemnation and shame heaped on whatever sleaze bag scum buckets produce the ad. I don't know who the firm is that did, but, but that ad is basically, you know, uh, a brown shirt special. And it is, it, it literally right now, you know, he may think and try and play off. Oh, I was trying to be funny or humor or whatever. Nothing funny. But honest to God. And furthermore, the guy's a Navy SEAL and he's running around advocating kill former Navy SEAL advocating killing other Americans at a time when one of his former colleagues, Dan Crenshaw was accosted at the Republican state convention in Texas by a bunch of brown shirts. It's whoever made the ad should be held should be made famous yeah. um infamous yep he infamous he if if he tries to run it on tv there should be a complete backlash and and quite frankly reporters and all americans should be outraged um mm-hmm. that he's putting stuff out out like this i am all for yeah. political speech but this is this is yelling fire in a crowded theater oh that absolutely Oh, this is priming people for violence. This is in a, a, it's from a psychological perspective, some of his followers, some of the people who are potentially voting for him are going to watch this and say, hey, this is open. It's, it's open season. It's open season on people we right. don't like. And that is absolutely not legitimate. Political There's discourse. nothing that could be more anti-American than what he is doing with that. And the worst part is he's wrapping it in the credibility that came from the blood of his former colleagues in the SEALs at, that, that made the, the credibility that he thinks he has in yeah. doing that. 
and in their blood defending the right for him to even run for office. It's outrageous, outrageous. Absolutely. So we're going to continue to pay attention to that race. That is for sure. Um, but before we go, uh, Trigby, do you have any predictions for tomorrow in Virginia? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I could I could take the easy way out and just say I bet you that a pro-Trump candidate is going to win in each of those in each of those districts. But that isn't really going very far. Um, you know, I well, I'm curious of- if. I'm curious if even something like this ad, which is clearly putting the military in a bad light, like I already saw people commenting that this makes the military look bad. I'm wondering if that might play into a lot of military people tomorrow considering where is my allegiance? Is it to country or is it to is it to party? Where's my allegiance? Well, every Republican candidate running, I just thought of this as, as, you know, with time now, they should all be being asked, do they agree with what he's saying in the set? Yep. <clears throat> They'll try not to answer it, but they should all be asked. Um, I think in those two districts, you know, um, I think Spanberger's district's more likely to, to, to be a place where you get the pro-Trump, kind of the Reeves or one of the pro-Trump candidates coming through. Um <clears throat> It's hard to say with with the other one because you know the one side of having all that military down there is you got a lot of people who are going to be voting absentee and otherwise. Um, but what I will say, I suspect the pattern continues that we're getting the more pro-Trump candidates are getting through as we've seen across the country. Um, this whole thing, what I would say, leave people with this this idea that Kevin McCarthy has been trying to purport and some other. Republicans, it's going to get better. It's not getting better. The people yeah. that they're nominating are are further to the right. And so this idea that the Republican caucuses and the Senate and the House after the election are going to be better and less Trumpy is just wrong. They're going to be far more Trumpy, far more illiberal. And there's going to be people like Greetons, potentially, who could end up in the U.S. Senate until Republicans stand up and say, no, this is wrong. Right. And also in that ad, he talks about it until they've gotten their country back. So he's this isn't right. just an ad for running for office. This is seemed to be an ad for trying to take over the country, um, which we've seen already uh, what that led to uh, violence and death. So, um, people, we need you to go out and vote. Everybody that's in Virginia, please vote with your country in mind and understanding that um, we are a diverse democracy, whether or not uh, people want to accept that. And so that means working together. That is how we are stronger. Um, because right now the GOP, it's bad news bears. If they had rifles instead of baseball bats, like it's just, it, they need to be stopped. And I think seeing what's happening in Texas right now, it's incredibly clear how dangerous they are in the plans they have for the rest of the country should they get back in power. So we can't let that happen. Um, we can't do this show without you um, or anything we do at the Lincoln Project without you. So uh, please, if you can donate, um, we, uh, we have a QR code that we can throw up there that you can use to donate. Um, you can also go to lincolnproject.us. Um, to do that as well, but we definitely need all, uh, all, all, everyone involved, <laughs> all hands on deck. Um, truly, at this moment in time, spread the word. Follow Trigvi on Twitter uh, at Trigvi Olson. I'm at Maya on stage. Um, and then don't forget to watch the breakdown tomorrow, Tuesday, following the hearings at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then Wednesday, you can catch Lisa Senecal and I on We're Speaking. Um, don't miss it because we have an incredibly good guest. We've got Barbara Walter on it. I'm super excited about that because she wrote the book, How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them. And I think we need to stop them. Um, so and that's I would say it. to anybody, can I just interrupt you for one second? Yes. Anybody who hasn't read that book? Um, you should you should watch it on the show, but you should read the book. I mean, I I I ended up reading that book recently. Uh, it, it's a must read for everyone who cares about democracy in the United States. You're spot on. You guys are lucky to have her. I'm incredibly, it's very timely that we have her. I'm incredibly excited. And uh, we keep talking about having a democracy book club. And so Trigvi, I might have to put you in charge of one of our democracy book club discussions because there are a lot that. of a lot of people out there who want to uh, discuss these ideas because that's how we um, feel like we're actually moving in the right direction is having these conversations and getting back on the same page, pun intended. So thank you uh, so much, everybody. We will see you 